The Halo series stars about three characters of note, two of which spend most of their time inside the same suit of armour. With this in mind, you'd expect people making a Halo game to kind of realise that people give a shit about these characters. If that's the case, you're giving 343 Industries way too much credit. So Brad, if I recall correctly, you've not played much Halo. Uh, only the multiplayer. Only the multiplayer, stories. okay. So for you, Brad, and the people watching at home who maybe aren't familiar with the games, the basic premise is that mainline Halo games follow the adventures of the man with the biggest dick in the universe. This man is called Master Fucking Chief. And throughout the mainline Halo games, he saves the universe from complete and utter annihilation using a variety of weapons, vehicles, and his own bare hands. <laughs> Considered the mascot of the Xbox and a consistent runner-up in virtually every character popularity poll ever conducted, Master Chief is rightly considered a beloved icon of gaming. It probably also helps the popularity of Master Chief that almost every game he's ever appeared in has been acclaimed by critics and has a multiplayer element that has pretty much set the precedent for how online first-person shooting games should be handled. In 2007, the lead creative force behind the Halo games, Bungie parted ways with Microsoft, who then handed off the Halo IP to an in-house studio called 343 Industries. Which brings us to Halo 5. <laughs> I do you not can like see the anger. I do not like Halo 5. <laughs> I'm not a fan of Halo 5. Is it objectively a decent game? It's a very solid first-person shooter. I don't consider it to be a very good Halo game, however. Yeah. During the early production cycle of Halo 5, fans almost immediately noticed something was amiss when all the promotional material for the game didn't feature Master Chief, but a new character created just for the game by 343 Industries called Spartan Lock. Who the fuck is Spartan Lock? Exactly. He's a new character created just for that game. Which is fair enough, like a lot of new games introduce a lot of new characters. One of the things that annoyed a lot of fans, myself included, is that Spartan Lock was retroactively inserted into the remastered version of Halo 2. Because you know what, if there's one thing fans of a series love, it's having a new character retroactively inserted into their favourite piece of media. Fans of the franchise were understandably a little concerned by this promotional material because it kind of suggested that Master Chief wasn't going to be in the game. Something 343 Industries tried to address by releasing a statement saying no, Master Chief is absolutely still the main character of the Halo franchise and will be the main character of Halo 5. You know, despite the fact he'd not appeared in any promotional material up to that point and everything related to the game pushed this new character 343 Industries had created. So I'm going to guess by the complete failure on your face to hide your utter contempt for Halo 5. And 343 Industries, yes. This was a lie. Yeah. While Master Chief is in fact in Halo 5 as promised, he is not the main character. In fact, he is only playable in three of the game's 15 missions. I'd like to point out that in the previous four Halo mainline games, Master Chief is the main playable character in all of them, save for a few missions in Halo 2 and in Halo 3 if you decide to play co-op, in which case one of you plays as the Arbiter. Am I right in thinking that Spartan Lock is basically the Poochie of Halo? Yes, he is absolutely the Poochie of Halo. For people who don't know what that reference is, um, in one episode of The Simpsons, obviously the Poochie episode, um, basically, a cartoon creator within the context of the Simpsons universe tries to spice up a show by introducing a new wacky character who's cooler than everybody else, and it just fails miserably. Wiggity wiggity, where the back on, party? When are they gonna get to the fireworks factory? <laughs> and it's like a perfect like example of just what happens when like creative people get desperate for new material and they run out of ideas and stories for like the existing characters in a series or franchise think, oh fuck it, put in this new character who's the coolest and the strongest. It's like, Spartan Lock is way cooler, he was always there, he's always in the background doing dirt when you weren't seeing him. He's definitely as cool as Master Chief, and obviously because they don't have the established context and the history that these existing characters do, they have to try super hard to know, no, they're cool, these characters are cool. Hey kids, always recycle. To the extreme! 
busted! By far one of the most frustrating aspects of Spartan Locke's inclusion in the Halo universe though was the fact that in Halo 5 he's shown to be able to hold his own against Master Chief in a fist fight. Virtually every game in the Halo series you play as Master Chief, so you the player know what this character is capable of. And I don't know about a lot of people playing, but my version of Master Chief destroyed every enemy he ever came across with a combination of gun butts, grenades and tea bags. Like my version of Master Chief is just like this immortal Batman tier God King. So when I play Halo 5 and I'm playing as Spartan fucking Lock, it's like this character beat up that character you played as for three games. Like, no, he fucking didn't. This, for anyone unfamiliar with it, is an amazingly frustrating trope known as the Wharf Effect, a lazy storytelling device used to establish a character as being badass at the expense of an already established character. Happens a lot in TV and film, doesn't it? It does, yeah, and the Warp Effect obviously is named after Lieutenant Warp from Star Trek The Next Generation, where to establish that a new character they introduced is being badass, they always used to have them beat up Warp. And like, this is okay once or twice, but by the end of like Star Trek TNG, Worf just seems like an absolute fucking shitbird. How is he the security officer on this when he's getting beaten up by every enemy who ever comes onto the starship Enterprise? Every other episode shows Worf getting his arsehole landed to him by another random enemy, including in one episode, a barrel. And that's not got a lot to do with the Warp effect, but I feel like it plays into the idea where they just consistently shit on this character so much that by the end of the series, he just doesn't seem badass anymore. And it's a similar thing in Halo where they spent so many games, usually with you controlling Master Chief, showing how awesome he is. Like, in that game, when you go onto the battlefield, the AI is programmed to run away from you. <laughs> Like if you kill certain enemies in that game, the smaller, weaker enemies will drop their guns and run away because they're that scared of Master Chief. They call him the demon. That's how terrifying you are. You are a legend amongst your enemies' ranks. And throughout those games, you effortlessly slaughter entire armies. And then in Halo 5, this guy, this mythological figure in this universe, this figure who is held up, like people think he's some sort of deity. He's some sort of like godlike being who just descends onto battlefields and just destroys all in his wake. Losers in a fist fight to a guy who was introduced 10 minutes earlier. It's like, so basically you just shit all over the legacy of this character for so 15 years building up. So this new character that you made seems cooler. And it's just, it always ends poorly. It just ends up making the character you already like look like an absolute tongue. <laughs> just like what? <laughs> so Brad, please, for my own benefit when I'm watching this back later, please replay the clip of Worf getting hit by that barrel. But please just put a Master Chief helmet on his head for me. <laughs> But here's the rub. After fans revealed that they were kind of annoyed that you didn't play as Master Chief all that much in Halo 5 and that the story kind of shit all over him, 343 Industries issued a statement saying that they were surprised at this response because they didn't realise fans considered Master Chief to be a main character in the Halo franchise. He's the only one anyone knows. <laughs> That's what makes this great. There are probably people watching this who've never played these games. I'm like, thank you for watching this far. And they're basically indulging my own ego while I basically like just get this out of my system, right? If you see a picture of Master Chief, I'm gonna guess people who don't even know the games know he's the Halo man. He's like, other than maybe Cortana, he's the only character people recognize in this franchise, like, like outside the sphere of gaming. And then three, four's like, we didn't, we didn't realise people thought he was the main character. He's the only character anyone knows. Like, my mum knows that he's the Halo man. <laughs> my mum knows that. She never played a game in her life. Everyone knows he's just the dude from Halo, if you don't know his name. Even if you consider all the expanded Halo universe stuff, like the novels and the games that don't directly feature Master Chief, he's almost always mentioned in some way because they have to do that wink, wink, nudge, nudge to like the most famous character in the series. Like, even in novels where he's not, like, in them, they still talk about, like, this legendary figure in their universe. Like, the legendary Master Chief. 
It's like, oh my god, the greatest hero of them all. How is he not the main character when he's the player avatar for four fucking games? But Brad, as it often does in these videos, it's about to get a teensy bit worse because according to series director Frank O'Connor, him and his team were confused to learn that fans of the franchise and the series and of Master Chief wanted Halo 5 to be either a continuation of or a conclusion to his story. And here's the best bit. Frank O'Connor acknowledges in the same interview that when they were making Halo 5, they were well aware of the fact people have been following Master Chief's story for 15 fucking years. And yet they still didn't realise that maybe the character people have been following for 15 years and the only real one anyone outside of the sphere of gaming recognises is the main character. <laughs> Not even the main character, a major character in the universe. <laughs> he saves the universe single-handedly. People are like, we didn't realise he was important to the story. He saves the fucking universe. Every character who's in that series is either... When he's not on screen, they are asking, where's Master Chief? <laughs> when Master Chief's not on screen, characters ask, where's Master Chief? <laughs> this Master Chief guy, he's in all the promotional material. He's the mascot of the Xbox. He's the main focal point of every mainline game. He's one of the most eminently recognizable figures in all of gaming history. Fans have been following his story for 15 years straight. The story mode of these games has been consistently lauded as being excellent. But who's the main character of Halo? I want to know. If they don't think he's a major character, who is? It's for, like, if they say Spartan Lock, I'm going to spasm so hard, I'm going to shit out a lung in rage. <laughs> if he's not a major character in that universe, who the fuck is? If the guy who saves the universe on his own isn't a main character, who is? For the non-gamers watching this, Resident Evil 4 is one of the most highly rated and best-selling video games of all time, which makes it kind of weird that it was only originally supposed to be released for his single games console. So for people like myself who never got the glory of playing Resident Evil 4, okay. sell me on it. Sell you on the game. Okay, well I could talk about right now how highly rated it was, how many millions of copies it sold, all the nuances of the genre it basically invented, action horror, However, I think I can sell you and everyone watching at home who never had a chance to play it on it with a single sentence. You can suplex zombies in this game while playing as the president's daughter. I think I'm going to need a bit of context. If <laughs> people can't see Brad's face, he's currently watching a looping gif of just the clip you just <laughs> saw of Ashley Graham just endlessly suplexing a Canado to death. So I'll explain. In this game, it's basically one giant escort mission where you play as Ultimo Badass Leon Kennedy. And your mission is save the president's daughter. Like, who you can see there just suplexing the shit out of a zombie. She doesn't need saving she me. Doesn't need... So basically, that's a bug in the game, because you have a brief section where you play as her, and she can only run around and, like, pick things up. However, she can also push open doors. And in that game, pushing open a door quite hard causes a zombie to be stunned, which means they can be, like, melee attacked. When you play as Leon, he either just kicks them in the face or suplexes them. However, they, for some reason, like, there's a holdover where they just gave that to Ashley, and obviously it's proven again that she can never do it because she has no weapons. But in that specific scenario, you can. And they took it out in updates of the game. In short, the game kicks more ass than an abusive donkey owner wearing three sets of spurs. Which makes the fact that it was originally exclusive to the GameCube kind of surprising. Why was that? Because the game's director, Shinji Mikami, fucking hated Sony at the time. And I believe there's a great quote from him when he was asked during an interview. So, Mr. Mikami, are we ever going to see Resident Evil 4? on the PlayStation 2 anytime soon. You know, because the PlayStation 2 is the best-selling console of all time, at the time. And he said, the day you see Resident Evil 4 on a Sony console is the day I cut my own head off with a chainsaw. But the game actually did come out on the PS2. Yes, and Mikami didn't cut his head off with a chainsaw when it did, because mysteriously, around the same time he softened his stance on the company, and around the time, like, Resident Evil 4 came out on the PS2. Sony drove a big dump truck full of money up to his house. So where does Microsoft come into all this? Well, after Mikami's relationship with Sony broke down prior to that big dump truck full of money arriving at his house, Mikami decided to screw over Sony by approaching their biggest rival at the time, 
Microsoft, who were just about to launch the Xbox, and offered them the chance to exclusively publish Resident Evil 4. However, the interview went so badly and so terribly that Mikami stood up and left halfway through. Do we know what happened in this interview? Yes, we do, because one of the guys who was present has talked about it at length and considers it one of the biggest missteps in the company's history. And according to him, like, Mikami arrived like a fucking rock star with wearing a leather jacket and mirrored sunglasses, because how else are you going to fucking turn up, with, like, a huge entourage in tow and only spoke through a translator. So he was sat there and he was, like, watching this translator talk to Mikami. And he found out after the fact that Mikami had asked this translator, okay, so PlayStation have got like the best selling console of all time and you haven't. What can you offer us as a company if we give you Resident Evil 4? And the translator just stood there slack jawed and went, uh... They couldn't even muster like a, a limp double finger point. It was just, hey, they couldn't even muster that. Probably the translator just stood there slack jawed and didn't have an answer. So is this what actually sunk the interview? You'd think it would be, because that's a really bad question to flub on during a business meeting, isn't it? What can your company bring to the table? And your answer is just dead silence for about five straight seconds. Like, imagine if that was like on a first date and the girl's there and goes, oh, so what do you see yourself bringing to this relationship? You just sit there going. <laughs> also as well, yes, I am stealing that bit from the Wayne's World movies, I'm really sorry. So what did sink the interview? Well, Mikami, being a nice guy, gave Microsoft the benefit of the doubt and like said, okay, if you can't answer that, just answer me this one very simple question. What is your philosophy as a company when making games? So what was their answer? <laughs> yes, they flubbed that question too and didn't have an answer for it. Holy shit, that is a bad meeting. I want to be a fly on the wall during that meeting because that sounds awkward as shit. 40 Japanese businessmen just sat in a meeting and a guy in with a leather jacket and sunglasses and just this poor translator just sat there going, ah, ooh, ah, ah, no, mm, ah, ah. And there's these people from Microsoft just sat there going, <laughs> because they don't speak Japanese. All they can see is this guy just absolutely bombing this interview. And they're like, what did he ask? And the guy's like, oh, I, I don't know. It's like Mr. Bean levels of like just like just ineptitude on display. And McCarney got so pissed off and they couldn't answer this simple question that he just stood up and left the interview and got on a train and went straight to Nintendo headquarters and talked to them. So what happened after the interview? Well, as you can imagine, representatives from Microsoft got fucking pissed with the translator and asked him like, dude, what the hell? And he explained to them, oh yeah, he asked me what your philosophy as a company was when making games, because Sony's about entertainment and Nintendo's about fun. And I didn't know what the answer was. If anyone was curious, their philosophy at the time was, we want to make video games that can be considered art. So that's like, you know, the generic response that you can give. But you know, it's a better response than nothing at all. And the, the translator's like, oh, sorry, I didn't know. You no one told me, I wish someone had. And I think the Microsoft guys, we've been talking about it all day. You work for us. How inept are you as a translator that you can't just turn to the Microsoft people and go, oh, we just asked this, can I get an answer? Yeah, what, what's your philosophy? No, you just sat there like a fucking lemon going, oh, ah, ah, ooh, mm, ah, mm, ah. It's like, what are you doing? I hope that guy got fired because fucking hell he shit at his job. But yeah, that it cost Microsoft Resident Evil 4, like I said, one of the biggest games of all time. And can you imagine that would have been a massive shot in the arm for that fledgling console to have Halo and Resident Evil 4? and Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3. By all critical metrics, DMC is a perfectly serviceable action game that had middling commercial success. According to fans of the original game series it was based on though, Devil May Cry, it was the video game equivalent of a wet fart. Something developers of DMC initially dismissed. Initially. So let's stick to our usual formula. Mm -hmm. Introduce this bit by telling us what Devil May Cry is. Well, Devil May Cry is a series of action games that start a character with a dick that is three miles long. Um, DMC is a reboot of that series. That is none of those things. Sounds like it's going to get really confusing considering that the games both have the same name and have the same character. Yes, especially given that this is a drinking video. So DMC, for the most part, is going to be referring to like, you know the reboot. And when I refer to old Dante, that's the original Big Dick Dante, and New Dante is Small Dick Dante. As the game itself admits, 
Because there is a scene in DMC where Dante is having a, like, shit-talking his brother Virgil, and Virgil says, I've got a bigger dick. And i got a bigger dick. And he has no comeback to that. Which means that Dante canonically has a smaller dick than his twin. So, Carl, describe old Dante. Okay, old Dante is a fucking badass. And as I mentioned, he's a guy with a dick that's three miles long, an impossibly sweet red leather coat, white hair and twin handguns that he can fire at 30,000 RPM. So his appearance sounds pretty cool. Mm. What's he like as an actual person? Um, an affable dumbass who never really tries and is effortlessly cool in everything he does. Generally though, he's just a super awesome nice guy you'd kind of want to grab a drink with, which goes all the way back to the very first game and an ethos handed down by one of the guys who had a hand in creating him as a character, Hideki Kamiya who said that Dante is like a stereotypically like clean-cut hero. He doesn't smoke, he doesn't drink, you know, he's not disrespectful to people. And his reasoning for that was is that Dante is simply too cool to do any of those things. He can't do anything without looking cool. Like, he can't even sit down. We've discussed it before, it's like Commander Riker-esque combos to his chair, just to sit the fuck down. The guy can't even eat pizza without looking like a badass. It's awesome. So old Dante sounds pretty cool. Well, by design as well, because the idea is that he's effortlessly awesome and cool in everything that he does, by virtue of the fact he's half demon. Oh yeah, I should mention, like, Dante is half demon in um, uh, the original Devil May Cry series. Like, he's a half demon who is born from a human mother, because his dad was like a big dick demon knight. He was like, you know what? Fuck, like, you know, hell. I want to get some of this earth booty and like, assumes human form, bangs an earth woman, and she gives birth to twin sons, Dante and Virgil, and they fight in the rain, and it's fucking sick. All right, so, new Dante. Yes, or oh, we can call him Dino, Dante in name only. That's the name fans came up with. In the vein of like Gino, Godzilla in name only for the shit creature from the 1998 Godzilla movie. I'm happy we're sticking with uh, Dino. Okay, we'll go with Dino then. All right, so what... Or Dante, that's another one. Dante. <laughs> what does he look like? A meth head. Uh, that... Oh, well, he okay. did originally, and then they toned down his design, and now he's like a uh, an angsty teenage edgelord. Because if people don't know, in 2010, despite Devil May Cry 4 doing quite well commercially, they like Capcom, the publisher, decided, you know what? Let's reboot this Devil May Cry shit. So they approached a company called Ninja Theory and tasked them with redesigning Dante for a Western audience. And this is what they came up with. My name is Dante. And that was the very first clip they put out of like, you know, there's the redesigned Dante. And the backlash was so severe, they toned down how he looked and made him look like this instead in the games, but even still, like, it's a radical departure from what Dante originally looked like, but it's better <laughs> compared to this dipshit. So what was the thought process behind Ninja Theory? Like, how did they go from what is obviously the much cooler Dante yes. to that guy? Well, the answer, Brad, is Fight Club. As in Fight Club the film? Yes, because you see, when Ninja Theory were tasked with, like, you know, making a more Western Dante, they sat down and brainstormed about like the differences between like you know um, Eastern and Western ideals of cool, and there is a fucking phenomenal like slideshow presentation they did about these differences, and they highlight specifically Tyler Durden as the quintessential like you know icon of Western cool. And he's just a cool guy, sexy, also. So the key point where yeah, so cool, Western, grounded, stylish. These were what we were looking for. Because. Who doesn't want to look up to, like, you know, a hyper macho posturing dickhead who beats people up in car parks? <laughs> Not to mention as well, he's a terrorist. <laughs> the, the quintessential icon of American cool. Terrorist. They made a bit of a misstep with that, but you can't argue that there are not differences between what's perceived as cool in different cultures. Oh yeah, and that's what that presentation was all about, because what Ninja Theory did is they helpfully photoshopped old Dante into various pictures to show why he's not cool. Like a, this picture that they genuinely put out of old Dante, you know, photoshopped into a scene from Brokeback Mountain. 
And I'm sure there is no ulterior subtext to putting that message out there and that image and saying this is why this character isn't cool in a film predominantly known for being a film about gay cowboys. Well, maybe, maybe. Uh, they didn't mean that. <laughs> so it's also as well, it's Dante, old Dante at least, I feel wouldn't give a fuck. So I, I get the feeling like old Dante, if you told him you were gay, would be like, I don't care, let's get some pizza. New Dante, I think he'd have some other words to say, given that his most iconic line in that series is, Fuck you! Fuck you! Fuck you! Fuck you! It just sounds like they tried to make him like super edgy. Yeah, and that's what I think so hilarious about it, because it's so obviously try hard edge. So there was a lot of backlash to the redesign of Dante. Yeah, understandably so. It's a well established character with a lot of fans, but. What's less understandable though is the seeming just like vitriol directed back at fans by Ninja Theory with a quote from someone like developing the game saying we don't care about fan feedback. You know, despite the fact that they immediately backtracked on that early design of Dante because everyone said he looked like a dick. But no, they said, oh no, we don't care that the fans don't like, you know, like this new redesign. Despite the fact the game is supposedly appealing to these fans. There was a lot of backlash, but yes. fair play to them for at least sticking to their guns and trying to make the game that they wanted to make. Well, yeah, and they did do that right up until it didn't make them any money. Because as I mentioned at the start of this piece, uh, yeah, DMC didn't sell all that well. In fact, it sold less copies than Devil May Cry 4. The game that sold so poorly, Capcom felt the need to reboot the entire franchise. And what they did is they released a definitive edition of uh, DMC that fixed a lot of complaints like gameplay wise and they're all well and good but it's the changes that they didn't announce that make you realise yeah they realised how dated and shitty and edgy this game was because there are some fucking brilliant ones. So what makes these unannounced changes so great? Because they're so minor in nature that they actually have nothing to do with the game itself and you can tell they were made specifically because they were embarrassed by them. For example, there is an exchange in the original version of the game where one character says to the big final boss guy, The world is at last your bitch, as am I. Nothing left but to grab it by the hair, bend it over and... <sighs> What's the matter? Because you know, Edge. And they cut that line out. And that's I mean, it's a single line of dialogue, but the fact they cut out a single line of dialogue tells you that they were embarrassed by it. So if it would have been the entire scene, that would be okay. But no, it's one line of dialogue that they edited around. And when a games journalist asked a representative from Ninja Theory, why did you cut this line? The guy went, oh, it was for pacing issues. Sure it was. Yes, a single line of dialogue was for pacing issues. Bear in mind that quote was given by the guy who wrote the story to the game. There's got to be more petty changes they made. Oh yeah, they edited the scene with the, um, the 360 quick scope abortion. The what? Yeah, I know what I said. I, I, that's don't, an accurate I, I don't know what you said. That's an accurate description of what happens in that scene. Long story short, there is a female character in the game who is going to give birth to the evil big demon's baby, and your brother in game, the hero that he is, decides to you know, stop this by shooting her in the back when she's unarmed through the stomach with a sniper rifle. And they cut that. No, they edited it. It's still in. But they edited it to make it like to make his motivations more clear. Which is ironic because like the most famous line of dialogue Virgil ever gives is, I now I'm motivated. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, now I'm motivated. It's like, you know, 360 demon abortion with a sniper rifle. So Carl, mm -hmm. let's talk about the hat. The hat, yes. And this is my favourite change. I think it's emblematic of the game as a whole. In the original DMC game, your brother Virgil spends the entire time wearing a fedora. And in the remastered version, the definitive edition, they remove the fedora. It's never explained, no one's ever talked about it, save for a few scant references to them always hating it. Which to me just sounds like the kind of thing someone would say if they tried to wear a fedora thinking it was cool. People made fun of them and then afterwards they said, oh no, I always hated it. My girlfriend told me I thought it looked cool. 
I know it's a minor thing, but that's what I find so funny about it. The fact that they genuinely thought the look that is most widely mocked online of guy wearing a fedora with a long leather trench coat and a katana was actually cool because that's what Virgil is in that game. He's that guy. He's that guy who poses with a katana and a trilby on and saying, yeah, challenge me to a debate, motherfuckers. He's that guy. They thought that guy was cool. So is that it for changes, or are there any other ones, maybe like one that you actually like? Oh, one that I do like is that they put in a skin for Dante that makes him look like Dante from Devil May Cry 1, called Classic Dante. <laughs> yes, they do. And that's especially hilarious, because there is a scene in that game that made it into a definitive edition where a wig blows onto the head of new Dante, and it's like a long flowing white wig. So he says to the audience, never in a million years. Not in a million years. Three years later, they release a skin where you can play as that Dante, and that scene still plays. As angry as I was at the time, though, when that happened, I love that in Devil May Cry 5, they've taken the high road. And do you remember that jab that they said about, oh yeah, Dante would never work in a Western? Yeah. Do you know one of the weapons that Dante has in the new Devil May Cry? A cowboy hat that fires meteors. Get fucked, Ninja <laughs> The Silent Hill HD collection was ravaged by critic and fans alike more than the souls of the people who live in the very world the game is set in. This is a huge flop by virtually every metric used to measure the quality of games. Perhaps the most impressive thing about the Silent Hill HD collection is how thoroughly it got fucked up. So, have you got an example that you would use to demonstrate how bad the Silent Hill HD collection was? Yes, and I don't think anything sums up just how just fundamentally broken the Silent Hill Collection HD was, uh, more than the fog or lack thereof. The Lakeview Hotel? Yeah, it's still there. The Lakeview Hotel? Yeah, it's still there. Yeah, the, the fog is like one of the scariest things in the game. Yeah, it's the most iconic thing. But arguably, yes, one of the most iconic things about the Silent Hill franchise as a whole is the thick, choking fog that permeates the entire world where the game is set. And uh, the, the reason it's so scary is because fucking anything could be out there in that fog. As evidenced by one of my favourite screenshots from a video game of all time, which you, Nisha, can see on a screen in front of you, correct? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, can, I can hear you laughing. So would you like to just describe the screenshot for people as it slides into frame? The main character stood next to a doghouse and the dialogue is probably a doghouse, though I'm not sure since there's no dog around. And then it's just the dead dog appeared into frame. <laughs> just to leaping into frame. <laughs> so like, gnaw on his arsehole. And Silent Hill's fog is fucking incredible at building tension and setting the tone. And much has been written about how just the, the thick, choking sex fog that covers that world is one of the greatest things in a video game. Because not only is it really, really good at establishing the tone of the game, it was actually only included to hide hardware limitations. Yeah, I was going to say it's probably helps with the fact that old games probably couldn't render as much as fast. No, they couldn't. And as good, no. so it, it would like, the, the fog would help cover that. Yeah, that's exactly what the fog was there for, because when they first started making the game, they realised that there is no way to realise the world we want the game to be set in. There's no way to make an entire sprawling town because the hardware we are making this game on physically cannot handle what we want it to do. So what they did is covered the world in this thick impenetrable fog you cannot see through, which hid the fact that the world beyond the fog does not exist yet. Because I believe nothing beyond the fog is actually rendered properly up until you the player can see it, uh, which helped create the illusion that the game world is much bigger than it actually is. Because mm -hmm. realistically, uh, the world is only as big as that like, you know, circle of fog that you exist in. But because you can walk for like three or four minutes in one direction and still encounter new things, it makes the world feel massive. Okay, so what happened with the HD version? Um, they removed the fog almost in its entirety, which completely and utterly annihilated the tone the series is now famous for. Because <laughs> that claustrophobic choking fog is, as we said, one of the most iconic things about the series, and they fucking took it out. And they had a good reason to. Like, well, the fog was there to hide hardware limitations. Why don't we take it out? But they never bothered to fix the lower resolution textures the fog was there to hide. Uh, 
I was a bit odd yeah. that the resolution was still quite low. It was awful. In some cases, it looks completely unfinished, and that's because the game actually wasn't finished. And that's because the versions of the games that the people who did the remaster got their hands on were reportedly unfinished builds because Konami had, for some inexplicable reason, lost the final mastered versions of those games. Oops. <laughs> so they were given unfinished versions of the Silent Hill series and told to remaster them. So when they removed the fog, like, there are parts of the environment that literally were not finished yet, that originally would have been hidden below the fog, which they removed. And oh, no. as an idea of how bad this was, one of the people who worked on the original game, upon being sent screenshots of the HD collection, assumed they were fake because they looked so shit. <laughs> like, people sent him a screenshot and was like, oh, this is what Silent Hill HD collection looks like. And they're like, no, it doesn't. How can it possibly look that bad? It's like, oh God, it does. Okay, so what else did they do? Uh, well, in addition to fucking up the visuals, they also messed up the audio. Uh, some of the sound effects were just wrong. Like, they put the wrong sound effects in for some scenes, and in some cases, they're just gone, so it's completely silent. <laughs> you're like, oh, great, of course, of course they also messed that up. I don't know, like, what specific ones are, but, like, there is a huge, huge list out there of, like, here's everything they fucked up um, from the original. Oh and people use that as reasoning for why you should never play the HD collection because it is just so broken and so badly implemented. Like, mm. The original games not only work better, but in a lot of cases look better. Because uh, like Silent Hill 3 uh, on the PS2 was fucking incredible for the time. I contend it holds up today. Yeah. For how good it looks given that it's like on 15 year old hardware at this point. Yeah. And then you look at the remaster, it's like, why would you play this? Why would you do this? Like, why would you do it to anyone? You might be thinking, wonderful folks at home, well, did they ever fix this? And the answer is, nah. <laughs> uh, Konami heroically refused to even acknowledge there was a problem. And, and when they did, and we did so begrudgingly, and then didn't bother to fix any of the many, many issues we have discussed, and the many, many more we haven't. I don't think anything sums up the lack of shits Konami gave about one of their champion IPs being raked over the coals critically like this, more than the fact they cancelled a planned patch for the Xbox 360 version, so it's never been fixed. Why though? Nisha, sweet summer child, it's Konami. <laughs> they do this shit all the time. Marvel's Avengers is a 2020 action role-playing brawler video game that is very bad. I added that part, but made, <laughs> developed by Crystal Dynamics and published by Square Enix. Based on the Marvel Comics superhero team, The Avengers. Would, do you think people would have got that from the title? Yeah. yeah. I know it's a Wikipedia article and they have to like write yeah. in a certain <laughs> way, but you think a game called Marvel's Avengers, that's kind of suggested by it. The game is played from a third person perspective and is very bad and has both single player and multiplayer modes, both of which are very bad, and feature online co-op, which is also bad, allowing players to assemble a team of heroes of their own. Not that it matters, because the game is bad. The initial roster consisted of... Uh, do, do you remember the roster, Lucas? The initial roster? The initial roster, yep. so it's Kamala Khan, Hulk, Thor, mm -hmm. Captain America, yep. Iron Man, and Black Widow. Yes, got it all right. So essentially, the characters who appeared in movies. Yeah, apart from Hawkeye, which then they dropped two Hawkeyes straight back to back. It's like, who's the seventh exciting character? Or eighth Hawkeye. exciting character is another Hawkeye. It's like, wait, what? Marvel's Avengers were released for Microsoft Windows, PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and Stadia. Fuck it, there's another wiki weekend that's waiting <laughs> to be made. On September 4th, 2020, the game received mixed reviews upon release, with critics praising its combat and story. I need to know what critics praise the combat in this game. And there's obviously a mistake here because there's a subheading that says gameplay. And I'm not going to read that because this has no gameplay. It's you press the button and you win. I don't know how this game has less depth than Marvel Ultimate Alliance. Well, yeah, that's the thing. If you want to play a fun co-op Marvel game with a load of heroes, may I add, go and play Marvel Ultimate Alliance like 3 on Switch. Yeah, because yeah, the gameplay in that is not deep, but you have a choice of like 80 fucking characters. <laughs> like you can team up like, you know, the Fantastic Four with like Super Scrolls and the Incredible Hulk and Ghost Rider and Venom and all that bollocks. And the Hulk doesn't punch as hard as Black Widow in that game. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, it makes no sense. The first time I got hands on Hulk and I punched like generic level one enemy and he took it, I'm like, no. <laughs> like the health bar <laughs> drops by a third. You're like, this is the fucking Hulk or Thor. It's like, 
these are like god powered beings and they're not taking out a guy in a SWAT suit in a punch. And Lucas, there are a couple of subheadings here. And what would you like to start with? We have pre release, post release, reception. See, I want to say reception, but I think like maybe touch on post release. Okay. Do you know what? Those are both a paragraph each. Okay. That, that's how you can tell that this game sucks because. No one's even gone to the Wikipedia page to fucking update it. So, a release trailer was released on Marvel Entertainment's YouTube channel in 2017, which announced the game. The game was under the working title, The Avengers Project, which is a better title. More than two years later, at E3 2019, Square Enix hosted a press conference that shared more details on the game, including a full trailer and the release date. The 14-minute presentation also showed a trailer made from in-game footage. A closed beta was available for those who pre-ordered the game. Man, I feel bad for those guys. I was just going to say, uh, they also, you know, along with that trailer, did declare that the game's um, microtransactions would not include, like, any pay-to-win elements. Well, Lucas, we've got a section just down here called Controversy, so don't worry about <laughs> Don't worry, we'll definitely get to that. Mario's Avengers was originally set to release on the platforms mentioned earlier, but was pushed back to the 4th of September in order to adjust and polish the game. It's rough that when they they delay it to polish it and it still comes out crap. It's hard to polish a turd. It is, Lucas, but you can roll it around in glitter, which they didn't even bother doing because did you see the thing about like cosmetic DLC where they use the same excuse they did for Star Wars Battlefront 2? Oh, that you don't want like a pink Darth Vader. Yeah. So to explain what I mean, folks, um, there was initially quite a bit of hype from this game. People like myself. Um, I just love the idea of like customising characters. And I played like a lot of Injustice 2 just to customise the characters in that game. And myself and a lot of other people were hoping that this Avengers game will be like that. It's like, even if the game plays bad, at least I can make a cool looking Captain America. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, almost all of the upgrades you can get for your character are non cosmetic because, and I want to say the quote something like, nobody wants to have like um, uh, Thor with Hello Kitty on his armor or something like that. To which the overwhelming response from people online is, yes, we do. That sounds <laughs> rad. Fuck off with these like bullshit excuses. Let us dress Thor in bright pink. That is such a missed opportunity because I would play that game. I would struggle through that game if I got to dress up my Captain America and I got to make him look like a dumbass. Well, you know, you, make, you get to make him look like a dumbass, but in the one specific way that they want you to because you can't even mix and match parts of the outfits. And you can just feel executives at Marvel and Disney saying, Captain America has to look this way. No, no. If he's wearing this outfit, he can't have this shield. And it just it makes the game more limited and less fun. The whole point of the online multiplayer element is that you go on, you play as your version of the Hulk. It's like, but he looks like everybody else's. <laughs> it's so bad. So yeah, post-release, following the initial release of the game, Crystal Dynamics released several free downloadable content packs, adding new playable characters and missions that continue the game stories. In June 2020, the first of these expansion was revealed to focus on Hawkeye. Later in August, Spider-Man was announced as a second playable DLC character, exclusively to PlayStation. And what do you have to say about that, Lucas? Um, well, A, it's not out yet. <laughs> That's what makes it so funny. It cannot be uh, understated how much this like crippled this game's chances of having any sort of public goodwill. Because they are essentially telling 50% of their potential player base to go and fuck themselves. I, um, I pretty much decided that I'm not going to buy the game because yep. of that announcement. As soon as I heard that, so I'm not paying for it. I'll play it when it goes on Game Pass because that means it's fucking failed. <laughs> <laughs> It's like when you refuse to watch a movie and it appears on Netflix like eight months later and you're like, oh, this did not do well. <laughs> so, critical reception. Marvel's Avengers received, and I quote, mixed or average reviews. Destructoid summarised its 6 out of 10 review, calling the game slightly above average or simply inoffensive. And that's like the worst thing to be. We obviously say this quite a lot, but just being so middle of the road and boring that nobody cares is like the worst outcome possible. Yeah, and I completely agree with that sentiment. And to explain what we mean by that, like something being just middling to average is the worst it can be because it means that no one gives a fuck. At least if it's like bad, it exists in like pop culture as like a touchstone and it's badness can become a touch point for discussions about other things or you can enjoy it ironically when it's just average or just, eh, there's nothing yeah. to say. Shaq News praised the campaign and unique character abilities. So you can ignore anything from Shaq News folks at home. US Gamer scored the game two and a half stars and wrote, if Marvel's Avengers was a single player story campaign, it would be amazing. Crystal Dynamics sells you on its version of the Avengers and introduces you to the charming and endearing Miss Marvel to players everywhere. Combat has, and I quote, depth to it, and each hero feels truly distinct. I will say that is the one 
common like come away that I've seen is that Miss Marvel. The, the Miss Marvel storyline was actually really good. Yeah. Almost as if like Crystal Dynamics are really good at making single player story based games. Electronic Gamer Monthly said Marvel's Avengers squanders the potential what might have been a fun superhero romp by a grafting on, and I quote, an annoying, overly repetitive games as a service component. And Carl, did you see what Square Enix said recently? And no, I did not, and you alluded to this before we started recording. Now, no, no, don't tell me. Tell me when the cameras are rolling. Yeah, because I just said, did you hear about the statement? Mm -hmm. it, that is all I like. So what's the statement, Lucas? Um, so I'm just, I'm not quoting this verbatim or anything, but in like a recent investors call or something, oh, Square always, Enix. That's where the real shit gets exactly. told. Exactly. Square Enix were like, oh, um, yeah, we are really disappointed by like the release of Avengers. And maybe we shouldn't have had like the company Crystal Dynamics do this because they're not used to making games as a service game. Essentially just like the whole state was throwing Crystal Dynamics under the bus. It's their fault that we told them to do this. And it's like, oh, I feel so bad because they got forced to make a game they didn't want to make. And then Square Enix kick them while they're down. And it's like, it's their fault. Blame them. It's not a problem. There is nothing that sums up how few fucks giant companies give as long as their bottom line is protected more than when giant companies throw other giant companies under metaphorical buses just to appease their shareholders. Even though we had almost complete and total control over this entire project, it wasn't our fault. <laughs> Post-release, in the weeks following its launch, Avengers saw a large player drop due to audiences frustrated at the game's current problems, such as bugs, repetitive gameplay, and lack of content. And that's the thing, lack of content. In a game which can plumb the depths of all of Marvel's comic history, there's like 70 years worth of stuff to get there. It's really bizarre how bare bones it was, and like, the fact that it's a games as service game, it's a multiplayer online game. It lives and breathes by like, no, you yeah. replaying missions and getting cool and shit. like the end game content didn't exist in a, a release like they waited over a year to add a raid into like an online multiplayer game peter morris of screamer reported that around 1190 players were on steam playing the game during a weekend in november 2020 a 96 percent decline since the game's debut 96 percent decline holy shit that's that game's dead that's like i remember seeing that headline that this is dead just that's kill like it dead on arrival like just make it free to play yeah and they did like a year and a half later i put it on game pass essentially yeah Yeah, it's dead just let it go it says um just a short while after release there was only as many as 500 players online at one point in the entire <sighs> game causing problems with matchmaking yeah no shit <laughs> Mike Fahey of Kotaku noted that players such as himself were growing bored of the in-game's repetitive features and lack of content. After receiving a statement from Crystal Dynamics, he advised players to go and play other games. Now, that's a person in the industry that direct lines Crystal Dynamics, and after raising these concerns with them, his only takeaway is, go play another game. Yeah, it's like, oh, so what are you going to do to no, fix this? Nothing. That's bad. Yeah, that's like when really bad. Like when you have a direct line to your audience and your answer is so bad that someone who is trying to save the game just says, go play something else. Yeah, because you know that that's clearly them reaching out like, what can I tell people to keep them playing and like get them back? He says, yeah, the guy loved the game, yeah, and he was yeah. disappointed that he couldn't play with other people. Sales and controversies are only like two sentences each. Should we just cover that dead quick? Yeah, let's go. Okay, so sales. Avengers was the best-selling retail game during its first week on sale in the UK. Probably just for that one week. It's probably the only game for sale that week. <laughs> um, in the US, the game was the top-selling title for the month of September and the second highest launch title in dollar sales of all time behind the, uh, of super, for a superhero game behind Spider-Man. Yeah, for a superhero game. For a superhero game. That's, that's the where they get it, yeah. Despite initial strong sales, Marvel's Avengers failed to turn a profit at all for Square Enix, with the public report an estimated loss of $63 million. Oh. 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 And then controversies. Controversies. In September 2021, Crystal Dynamics and Square Enix introduced XP boosts, which can only be purchased via real, real world money. XP boosts allow players to gain more experience points for a short period of time, allowing them to level up faster. And Lucas, uh, do you want to explain why this was controversial? Uh, yeah, because I don't know the exact phrasing they used, but basically when the game was announced, it was basically said, we will not uh, like give you any game advantage via real-world purchases. Yeah. The company previously promised that the game would only feature microtransactions for cosmetics and customization items only. It also says here that in March 2021, 
um, they deliberately changed the progression system, which made leveling up a longer process. Oh yeah, they did that, and apparently it's a massive grind. These three things, you can just draw a straight line between them, are a massive loss of funds for the company after a disappointing release, a update to the game that makes leveling up more difficult for anyone playing it, the release of paid DLC that allows you to level up faster. And now um, they've apologised, and they, are said, they said they are removing those XP boosts because they didn't realise that players would be annoyed because it's not directly affected to your like power gain. Even though leveling up does make you more powerful. And didn't you say the excuse they're using is that it doesn't make you more powerful because you only get experience points and you have to spend the experience points to then power up your character. So because you have to have that extra step to power your character, that's not technically paying to upgrade your character. It's not technically being like a direct effect on your power gain. It's like... But it is. There's one extra step you have to do and the step between it is like this high. Yeah. And it's also a straight line. <laughs> it's just, what a fucking bag of wank. 